Парижа. И сегодня он будет рассказывать на очень, очень близкой нам тематике вибрационные эффекты. Ну, первый пункт это еще пока без вибраций, это пучневой эффект в жидкости в близких термодинамической критической системе. Сегодня две темы у нас. Вторая тема – это термоэвакционное явление, термоэвакционная коллекция в сверхкритических жидкостях, то есть в адекватных системах, там вообще в условиях пониженной гравитации, то есть либо в невесомости вообще, с умом Значит, доклад будет на английском языке происходить, поэтому мы включим Значит, если у вас есть вопросы, можно задавать вопросы по ходу семинара. По-русски можно задавать, мы поможем вам. Или если вы можете по-английски, по-английски можете, то по-французски можете задавать вопросы. Ну и ответы тоже, если есть необходимость, мы сделаем. А, да, я, поскольку у нас здесь присутствуют новые люди, то я должна сказать, что профессор Бейсинс работает в знаменитой высшей школе физики и химии, высшей школе технической физики, технической физики и химии в Париже. Это школа, в которой окончена 6, в которой работает 6 нобелевских лауреатов. Это Пьер Мария Кюри, Фредерик Жори Кюри, Фредерик Жори Кюри, Ланжеренто, я время был директором этой школы, затем Беже. Один еще, в основном физики лауреатов на Нобелевских премий и по химии, например, Мария Крик получила химию на Нобелевскую премию и Жапак тоже на Нобелевский лауреат. То есть это очень знаменитая школа высшая, вообще во Франции окончить высшую школу это очень престижно, более престижно, чем университет, у нас такая система. И эта школа поддерживается даже в Индии в своем носе, в имя Кольца Парижа, то есть это есть Кольца Парижа, Физиэль и Индустрия, Вильда Парижа. Поддерживается на Индии. Исторически очень важная и очень сильная школа. Профессор Бейсенс, он специалист в, ну, во-первых, вот в этих самых средах, speak uh, any more uh, Russian, <laughs> hopefully for you. And so yesterday we were speaking uh, about uh, colloids and wedding transition. Tomorrow we speak about condensation. Uh, but there is uh, some unified view about all this work. That's uh, phase separation. And here that's, you, we will tell something about phase separation and phenomena near a very important point of phase transition, which is the critical point. So that's in fact one, uh, uh, one that's two, uh, two presentations, but we, I collect them in one. One is to, to look uh, at the thermal effect when we have very compressible fluids, like fluids near the critical point, and also what's going on when you these fluids, they are vibrated. These fluids are very sensible to any external perturbation, an external force, and so the effect that is usually small or not detectable on, uh, on usual fluids will be uh, magnified and make them very 
easy to observe, and also thanks to the universality of the critical part, all the results could be put in universal scale uh, master curves. So, we start by the critical point phenomena. Uh, you were here yesterday. That's a summary of what I said yesterday. So uh, I will try to be fast. Uh, I, you remember, uh, the critical point phenomena was discovered by Charcagnard de la Tour, at least qualitatively, in 1821. Uh, by the way, this, was, this gentleman was also the inventor <coughs> of the siren. Ooh, 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 you know, he invented the, the siren. And so he was making experiments in a seal gun uh, because of the high pressure with CO2. And to know whether there was a liquid and gas phases, he was shaking it. And uh, he was hearing the splashing. And he was really surprised, amazed, when, uh, when he saw that about 31 degrees, he couldn't hear anymore the splash. That's because liquid and gas phases became the same a gas, a dense gas, a supercritical gas. He, so he, he went through the, the critical. So, but the that's rather long rules and uh, the base who made uh, the scientific study of this phenomenon, and that's uh, remember we go faster. That's pressure temperature phase diagram, three phases: solid, gas, and liquid. Saturation line, if, on which you have vapor and liquid, and above you have a dense gas. It is a gas which has a density of liquid. This is the other phase diagram. With the, and this is this diagram, pressure temperature here, and that's the, surf that's the surface uh, where you can uh, get all these very classical curves. Now, there is a fundamental interest of working near this spatial point because this spatial point, if you take the right variables, you can put all the results on scale, universal uh, form and that are representative of a class of materials. For instance, the gas liquid, liquid mixture, magnetic isomax system behave the same. And um, also you have very strong anomalies near the critical point, very large compressibility. Also the diffusion of heat is very slow, but the critical slowing down. You have a you have large fluctuation also of density or concentration for liquid liquid mixtures. There is also a strong industrial interest uh, for CO2. CO2, if it is, if it is in the supercritical region, is a, a large density uh, gas, but it becomes a very good solvent, solvent of organic materials, and it is clean. It's not like benzene. It's better than benzene, in fact. It's clean for chemistry and other elements. Also, you know that we try to store CO2 uh, in the <coughs> sea and beneath the sea, and uh, CO2 uh, above 72 bars uh, is supercritical. So that's, that's interesting to study it. And now in water, water, the dielectric constant of water goes down when you are supercritical, so it is no more a solvent because water is very good solvent, the best solvent of the universe. And so, for instance, so. Uh, uh, all, all, the, the, all the materials that can be dissolved in the water, like silica, for example, that cannot be dissolved anymore. And so this change all, all the properties. And you can make the water is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, host of uh, combustion, core combustion. You can burn uh, ammunition, waste at about 500 Celsius. And so you have another production of very bad uh, smoke or uh, dangerous uh, products, and that's used for ammunition and waste. Now there are other interests, especially in the sp space, because you know that if you want, for instance, the, in, the, in the space shuttle, uh, electricity is, is, is given by uh, fuel cells with hydrogen and oxygen, and that's in a super critical condition, because when you open the tap, you don't have to know where, where is the gas and the liquid phase. You are always in a dense gas phase. And so when you open the tap, you go from this state to that state. So from 
currently going to gas. We will have to create formation of interface that should have formed if you go from the liquid to the gas phase. Also energy. Uh, if you increase the temperature of a thermal plant or a nuclear plant, uh, you know that you are increasing the, the yield. And uh, only a few percent of yield gain give you more on the cost of the kilowatt hour per hour. And Siemens in Germany and also in, in people in Japan, they are using uh, supercritical water. Now also for the thermal properties, and that's a piston effect, that I will tell you more uh, now, a little bit later. <coughs> That's a phenomenon that we have discovered thanks to space experiment. Uh, as uh, you will see, uh, we were eager, eager of uh, having a cell, having a thermalization of a cell. And that's the way we discovered So now that's typical uh, temperature and pressure and density of uh, Critical pond, adogen, that's 33 kg, so minus 240 Celsius. Pressure, 1.3 megabar, and that is 13 uh, bar. And uh, density, uh, rather small, CO2, 31 Celsius, 73 uh, bar, and nearly 0.5 density. And water, you see, the density is rather large, for the pressure is large. 220 bars and temperature in Celsius is also large. So that's all the typical part we are using in our experiment. So that's the properties, you know, can be put in universal scaling laws for a gas and liquid near the critical point. When I say near, that's not one decade. This goes from say 100 degrees till 1 micro -K. So the compressibility diverges with, with the exponent 1.239. And so this means that the compressibility near this 1K, 10K, 1 mk will become very large, much larger than ideal gases. Specific heat on a constant volume also diverges, but a very weak, weak exponent. But that's not so much. That's a factor of 2, not a factor of 1,000. Density of two phases becomes, goes to zero near the critical point with this exponent, 0.325, that is, when you are closer and closer to the critical point, the density becomes closer also. Uh, the pressure, okay, I don't discuss this, we won't need it. Also, the, so near the critical point, you have very strong fluctuation of density, and so uh, when you are going closer and closer, the fluctuation of amplitude increases, but due to the fact that the compressibility increases, and that is, uh, the thermal energy is converted to density fluctuation, thermal fluctuation to density fluctuation. And so you, you can define a correlation function of the fluctuation of the density and a typical correlation length, which diverges near the critical point with this exponent nu 0.62. That is, when you are closer and closer to the critical point, the amplitude of fluctuations that are proportional to the compressibility diverges. And the extent of the fluctuation, that is the question then, also diverges. So just, just a few things. Now there are relations between exponents, thermodynamic, expan uh, thermodynamic relationship, but also more, more uh, subtle relation that is between the, uh, the exponent of the specific heat and uh, the, um, the, the space dimensionality. So I won't discuss it, but uh, that's the same for amplitudes. And in, in fine, uh, at the end, there are only two exponents and two amplitudes that are independent. And this is a so-called two-scale factor universality. So if you know two amplitudes, for instance, the amplitude of the Coelichthaus curve, that's easy to get and the correlation length that is easy to get by last scattering, <laughs> that is line transition, for instance, you get all the other, you get the compressibility, specific heat, etc., etc. So that's a very uh, nice concept. So that is, all the fluids will be able to say within two scale factor. <coughs>
Okay, so this is, for instance, a universal relationship between the amplitude of the correlation length and the amplitude of the uh, specific heat. You see the relationship that is uh, psi by P one third is equal to point two seven. So if you measure the specific heat at constant volume, you will get the amplitude of the correlation length. Okay, so now that's no need to show that how the heat behaves, that the compressibility, density, pressure, temperature, is divergent at temperature minus critical temperature and exponent gamma. And you see, this is a log log plot, compressibility and reduced temperature, T minus Tc over Tc. And you see, it goes with this power alone in the pinnacle point, but further, it doesn't go this way because there are some correction to this asymptotic. So now if you need measure, if you need data, if you need numbers, figures, you have to know exactly at the range in which you are. Because you may have is here uh, an exponent. If you measure like this area, the exponent is different from the acceptable one. Uh, another thing is uh, simple. Okay, now also when you are doing closer and closer to the critical point, the fluctuations are larger, the amplitude is bigger, so they, they slow down. And I will show you uh, fluctuation that we have measured uh, in space, that in SF6, that because on the ground the system is so compressible that it compresses under its own weight, either in a few millimeter uh, high sample. And so this means that you have, when you are going too close to the critical point, you are going away from the critical point. So you cannot go close to the critical point on that. So this is really, really very close. Uh, that's 10 micro K. The correlation length is 5 microns, and the typical time of relaxation is very slow. So I will show you uh, the picture. So the fluctuation that you see, the fluctuation in intensity, they are all right. And you see that if you fix one point, say for instance this one, and it's becoming is moving. Then go another place here, for instance. And so, what is the phenomenon of, of moving of this situation? That's diffusion. And so, the, the, the lifetime of this situation will depend on their size, of course, but will depend also on, on the diffusion the coefficient, the thermal diffusion coefficient. So we can define the thermal diffusion coefficient uh, very simply by KT, and thermal energy, divided by 6 pi eta, that the shear viscosity, and psi, that's the correlation length of fluctuation. And you see, because psi diverges, this goes to nearly zero with the exponent 0.67 because the viscosity has a weak uh, divergence. So it is as if you have uh, some uh, fluctuation somewhere and that it diffuses out. Simple. Now, if you look at the time, the typical time that the time that the fluctuation of size psi diffuses on length scale psi. So this corresponds to d t minus 1 psi squared, and you see that as the cubic uh, power of psi. And uh, so, it, since, since the exponent with temperature is 0.63, 3 times 0.63 does roughly uh, 2. So now, for the density of temperature equilibration of a sample, uh, what you are, look, you are looking say, to a typical sample of, of CO2, for instance, and 1 mK from the critical point, thickness to E1 centimeter, the time that roughly E squared of dt, and if you make the calculation at one mark. That's a critical slowing down. On the ground, this was, this is never observed, because when you are hitting a cell, the system are very uh, unstable, and you have a lot of convection. So this was thought. But in fact, uh, you will see that there is another phenomenon that will speed up the process. Now, you have gravity effects in this sample. 
uh, if the gravity affects, uh, you can measure it by the competition between the weight, uh, that's a wall, that's gravity, Z, and there is, a, say, a liquid and a paper phase, and you see uh, the capillary uh, force makes this line, that line, to spread to wet, but gravity prevents it to go uh, very, very far. So the curvature of the meniscus gives you uh, gives you the, the force, the capillary force with respect to the gravity force. And so it appears that the surface tension, liquid vapor, that you can express as the energy per surface, that's an energy per surface area. Here the typical energy that's KT, KBTC, typical area that's the fluctuation area psi square. And this goes to zero with this exponent. And that's the now, uh, if you look at the capillary length, which is surface tension by G, gravity, and delta rho, difference of density, delta rho goes to zero with this exponent. And so the capillary length, you go to zero with that exponent. This means that when you are going to TC, the capillary length tends to zero, so the gravity effect becomes more and more pronounced. That's why. It is mandatory to perform experiment in zero gravity if you want to uh, look at uh, capillary effect, surface effect. Okay, now I have finished with all of this uh, critical point stuff, and now we go to the, to the one of the main points that is thermalization. So this was something we thought it was about. started the first experiment in space and the problem was uh, could we have enough time uh, to have a cell at constant temperature at uniform temperature uh, if we have if you have no gravity effects to uh, with the convection to stir the sample so all the story so far is is being published in this book with my colleagues and nevertheless friends, uh, Bernard Zappoli and Yves Garados, and we are, uh, well, uh, we are waiting for the print. So, now, let's imagine you have a semi-infinite medium, that is a wall, a cell with, which is very, very, very thick, and adiabatic, and that's open here, so you will heat it up. So that's a process at constant pressure. If you heat it up, there is a boundary layer that forms, the density, if the initial density was critical density, this layer is hotter, so the density has been decreased and it propagates by diffusion. So you can define the length scale of this boundary layer, which is delta, and that the root square of thermal diffusion and time, and if you put the right number, this goes to zero, uh, and you get something like T minus Tc, exponent 0.33 and root square of time. This means that the amplitude depends on T minus Tc, could be smaller as you are going closer to Tc. Now, if you look at the time to thermalize the sample on the length L, that L square of dt, and you see that this time will increase when I'm going to Tc, so the closer to Tc, the longer the time to thermalize the sample. Now, let's put some figures, that's a constant pressure, over one centimeter at that one k from the critical point, it will take one minute. That's a rather, rather long time. So we were really, uh, that's really bad, because if you have a sample of one centimeter, and this was like the first experiment was in the space shuttle, a few months later, the mill station. Oh my god, we have to wait one week. Even so far from TC, no experiment could be done. And in the space shuttle, we were also with American people, and these people, they were putting a stirrer. It was, we really didn't know. But we had some ideas that sometimes another process could occur because the cell, in fact, is closed. So the process is not entirely at constant pressure. So this is the experiment in the near station. 
and the weight was 70 kilo and the sail was much lighter. It was only uh, 0.3 gram of fluid mass. And uh, you see that's a very small sail. Uh, the windows are made with sapphire and epoxy. This is SF6 uh, fluid and the critical uh, temperature that's 45.5 uh, Celsius. So that's an easy temperature for it. So that's typical. Okay, so I go back. So you, you, we are looking, we are sending light through the cell and looking inside the cell. So of course, if we eat, eat it up, the minuscule disappear. We are in the super critical uh, region. So that's what you can see if you put the cell in an interferometer. That's a window. There are fringes, so that's uh, not very good, but it's a defect of <coughs> And they, we put two thermistors. One is TH1, the other is TH2. That's a 0.2 millimeter diameter. And I will show you, that's interesting, I will show you the, the first uh, video we got from the MIA station which show that something else occurs when you want, when you change the temperature. So uh, the idea is the following. We here we heat with this we heat with this thermistor. So there is a boundary layer that will form and we see how the burnt temperature will change and we measure with this uh, thermistor. So that's complicated because I, I have to go. It's a non-professional video. That is, it's a, it's a professional video, but uh, this has been recorded in a near station, uh, sent to the ground in a K-set. This was in 1992, so 20 years ago. That's a long time ago. And after, at CNES, they made a special movie with that. So I will look to this movie. Oh. Sorry, it takes time. So that's on the ground. Okay, here it is. And you see that uh, that's a boundary layer forming and all the fridging are displacing. You want to see it again? It was very fast. That's a boundary layer, and you see all the fringes are moving. And what is important, the fringes are straight. And after, what you will see, there is a jet. So we are really, really, really surprised by this observation. Really surprised, and that's something we have to, I have to explain to you. Okay, so the explanation is that, so remember, there was a thermistor. We heat so there is uh, something uh, hot region and some conductive along the thread. And all the fringing, fringes remain straight and move uh, all together. This means that when you heat uh, the sample, the bulk temperature is homogeneous. And also what matters is that the bulk temperature change, changes Instantaneous. So there are two, two important points to, to, uh, to explain. Fast, and that's fast change of temperature, and homogeneous temperature in the sample. And this was not predicted by the, 
the theory of diffusion of a boundary layer. So now if you look at uh, if you look at a closed sample, the wall that you hit, uh, let's simulate, let's simulate the regular code, that's the most, okay. uh, and adiabatic wall, isolated. So when you hit it, you have also a boundary layer forming, the same, so density is lower. But in, and it propagates with the same time as before. But the bulk is homogeneous because this compresses the whole fluid. You know, the, the, the system is very delectable, so the bulk, the, the, the boundary layer, expands and compresses the fluid. So what we have seen, that the bulk thermalization by an uh, isotropic effect, by a pressure effect, the pressure in the sample rise, and so its temperature rises also. And so that's why it is, there is a strong acceleration of the thermal equilibration. Instead of having, we will see that instead of having a critical slowing down, we will have a critical speeding up. And also, this, the, the bulk temperature rises homogeneously, but this is a cost the cause that's the formation of the boundary layer which makes the, the fluid inhomogeneous. And this would be now the problem for the experiment. The temperature change very rapidly, but you have a boundary layer that forms and that stay very long because this boundary layer, it is diffusive, it will take a diffusive time to vanish. And that's very interesting when we discuss the vibration because if you have some acceleration vibration, you could develop instabilities in the boundary layer. So now, you see the piston effect, what it is? Formation of a boundary layer with different density, density is less. This boundary layer uh, diffuse and compress the whole fluid, so the, the pressure rises. And so the temperature rises also and is uniform. So now uh, we we have to calculate the time of equilibration, and something uh, easy it is to say that we will have equilibration when the energy of uh, the energy in the boundary layer is the same as the energy in the bulk. So the energy in the boundary layer in one dimension that delta delta the sign of the layer by Cp that's a, pre, a constant pressure. Uh, process and inside that's a constant volume process so that cv cv the specific heat of a constant volume and the length that's l minus delta but as delta is really very small we can read the approximation that l c so now we 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 can define the size of delta for thermal equilibration and that delta is equal to l the, thick, the length of the cell divided by gamma Gamma is Cp over Cv, and Cp over Cv diverges near the critical point with this exponent 1, 1, 1, 2, 3. And so now the time for equilibration, that the time to reach this typical length delta, so that's Td, that's uh, d, dt minus 1 uh, L squared by gamma squared. So there's a time to diffuse not on L, but to diffuse on L divided by gamma. And so now, instead of having a time that, if you put the right exponent, instead of having a time that goes to infinite near Tc at Tc, it's a time that goes to zero at Tc. So instead of having a critical slowing down, we have a critical spinning up. So that's a strong acceleration. And for instance, now, if you are at 1k from the critical point and 1 centimeter cell, instead of uh, one, one week, it will take 100 seconds. But the cost is the formation of a hot thermal boundary layer, or cold if you are cooling down. Okay, so now we can look, go, look to some of the process. In a cell, you have a wall, but you can have also another wall that is at constant temperature. 
So you have two conductive walls, two adiabatic walls, and what what uh, going on if we hit one wall but keep this one at constant temperature? So very the temperature of the bulb will rise very uh, rapidly, and we'll have the formation of a cold boundary layer. So we have now two diffusive boundary layer forming, and you have two piston effects, one heating piston effect and one cooling piston effect. Okay? But inside, that's homogeneous, and that's interesting because this is a thermal short circuit. And so it means that we can make, perhaps, a heat pipe that is pro uh, propagate, heat, uh, heat transport on long distance by these two uh, boundary layers and this big thermal short circuit. And that's something we have studied. The answer is yes and no. Yes on short time, no on long time. And you, you will understand why, because on long time you have this boundary layer that propagates and you will have a conductive, con usual conductive effect. So that's also something interesting because uh, the piston effect is, a, is an isentropic effect. But you know that you cannot produce heat uh, isentropically. Uh, but uh, if, you look, uh, if you look in details, you see that's not uh, exactly an isentropic effect because that's isentropic inside, but you have boundary layer, and in the boundary layer, that's not isentropic. So that's an interesting thing to discuss. Now, so, the can we make heat pipe with piston effect? So that's something we have investigated on the ground. On the ground, we, you can, you can uh, suppress the gravity effects in pure fluids, in pure systems, thanks to a magnetic force. Indeed, the magnetic force is proportional to the local density, as the weight is. And so if you take uh, Coil. Uh, you, uh, this coil can make uh, can, the magnetic field is not uniform, and near the end you can make a gradient that is a constant gradient. That's the gradient here, yeah, magnetic field, and you see that near the end you can make nearly constant gradient, and the magnetic force is proportional to the gradient. That's the gradient of the field the square here, B square. And so, in hydrogen, the susceptibility of hydrogen is such that you can levitate, you can composite the weight with a uh, coils that you have in the lab, that super coils, because you need something like, uh, this product should be something like 500 this that square per, per, per meter. And this, in the lab, we have some, we have 10 Tesla. Coil, and near the end of the 10 Tesla coil, we can compensate the weight in a small center of hydrogen. It has to be small if you want a good homogeneity of compensation. So I have to say that's levitation if you want. That's not levitation, that's on a summit. Because you have a force that can levitate. Here, you compensate in all the volume. Okay, so that's the, the sample. That's the size, you see, that's a man's side, that's the D war. So here it is, that's prior stat. So you have um, helium at the lambda point, uh, 2.17 K, you have the coil here. And uh, here you have the sample with the thermal tap. But I'm going to give details if you want to play, so we'll give you later. So now that's the cell we are using, so that's a, that's a pipe, as you see. We uh, sell it to uh, the, 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 what I call the basis at the top, that's copper. This is, uh, the, the base is connected to helium with a heater to maintain temperature constants. And the, uh, here you have a leak here, and we measure temperature here. And the idea is to send heat at the top and see how we can transport heat on the basis. Okay? 
so that the plexiglass tube. Plexiglass is interesting because the heat conductivity of plexiglass is not far from the heat conductivity of liquid hydrogen or superpellicular hydrogen. That's the head, heat, thermometer, phases, heat, thermometer. And so when so we maintain constant with this power, and that's important to understand. With this power, we maintain the temperature of the basis constant. So, when we send heat, if the heat is sent on the basis, if the heat is brought to the basis, this power will decrease. So, we will measure the power that is transferred to the basis through this tube. And you see that when you heat the head, we form a hot boundary layer, piston effect will rise the temperature of the bell, and so we form a cold boundary layer. Well, that's the result, so we could measure this wave the transmitted power, that's the time, that's the transmitted power, that's the heat we send in the head, 7.5 milliwatts during 300 seconds. So 300 seconds, that's a long time, that's 5 minutes. And so you see, that's interesting, that's here, if you have uh, in vacuum, so no gas inside, and you see that you have to wait, say, nearly 100 seconds, that uh, heat propagates through the walls of the tube, uh, through the walls, to reach the basis. Now, if you put gas in it, that's super critical uh, hydrogen, this is at 3K from the critical point, and this is pretty close, 5 mK from the critical point, you see that you have, from the very beginning, a resonance. <coughs> so, due to the crystal effect, you have a very fast transport of heat. But, you know, you send 7.5 mW, you get only 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and the maximum you get 1. So, the yield is not very good, but the dynamics is very good. And when you go closer and closer to the critical point, this increases. So you can transport heat with the piston effect, but the yield is not very important. In that 30 per, can be 30%, as you will see. Uh, but only about 30 percent, 25, 30 percent. But it is very fast compared to conduction. Now we perform simulation, a two-dimensional simulation, no other dynamics, only the equation. Uh, it is pressure. We simulate, we calculate the pressure rise and we calculate the isotropic temperature rise of the bell. So that's the heat uh, thermometer that is connected to here, so there is a heat plus. Hydrogen, also heat through the wall of the, of the tube, temperature of the basis, etc. So that's what we uh, see. And that's the result. That's the power transmitted to the basis, that's time, in the red that's the power, <coughs> and in blue that's the temperature of the head, minus the temperature of the basis. The, the, the triangle that's the data, experimental, and the line that's the that's dissimulation. And that's for an anti cell. And you see that it perfectly fits the data. So we when the cell is empty, our equation and simulation is fully correct. Now, when we fill the cell, that's not exactly so. We don't use, we didn't use a Van der Waals equation of state, we use a real equation of state. And the problem is that the real equation of state is not very well known. People have not performed a lot of experiment in nitrogen, and we did it because of the space industry and the defense, so they never published it. So, that we, we had to take the uh, equation of state from the NIST uh, in the United States, in Washington, but it is not very accurate near the critical point. And so that's in red the power, and you see that's the data and that's the simulation. Well, that's semi quantitatively, that's correct, that's not a, there is something like it, as you can see, but it's not so bad. Temperature uh, of the wall. This is blue, and these are the data, a little bit better. 
And just to tell you, that's a vacuum. And that's interesting to see that from the comparison with this blue line and the dot line, we can get the conduction with, with the wall. And that's not simply the subtraction between the thermal condition in the wall are different with the gas than with vacuum. The, the thermal gradient is different. So you cannot subtract it directly. Now, from a simulation, now that's interesting because you can simulate the cell whose length is larger. And that's the, the transmission with time with a cell of, say, that's the, the cell of the, 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 the first cell, 16.5 mm, 33, that's the cell with the experiment, and a very big cell. So you can see that, in fact, when the Length, length increases, the power diminishes, and so the yield. That's the yield in uh, directly. So the yield is nearly 10 percent for 16 millimeter and goes to two per two percent. But what is interesting? That there is still a fast uh, response. Now we can see how uh, this behave to the length. That's the maximum here. Maximum. And you see, it decreases with the length, and that's that's interesting. That's a log dependence. You see, that's log length, and that's linear. Uh, that's the of uh, the year. So we don't know exactly why, but it is. That's something we didn't investigate so far. Now we can also that's interesting. We can generalize to another fluid instead of hydrogen. We can use um, we can use uh, CO two and see how the yield, so that's interesting because at maximum power after 300 seconds with T minus TC and you see that the yield increases very much and can go till 30% for a 16 millimeter. So that's what we did. We studied beyond, uh, as a conclusion about this piston effect and heat transfer. What is positive and interesting that the piston effect may be transport much faster than pollution. But what is less interesting that the yield is less and it has to be less than the yield with conduction. I didn't show you the argumentation, but the maximum yield we can get that's pure conduction. So to use a, a piston effect for uh, to, to transport it on long distance, that's not something interesting. Uh, just not something interesting. But, it, uh, but that's something interesting if you look in terms, you know, the heat pipe, they use a phase transition. So the yield of the heat pipe depends on the temperature difference between both ends. Here, it doesn't depend on the temperature difference. So I think there is some interesting work to do for five theorists to see how this couple with the first and second principle of thermodynamics. We didn't do and the fact that inside it is isotropic. I think there is some fine work to do, just for fun. <laughs> okay, now the uh, piston effect again. Well, I, I'm really late, but okay. The piston can provoke a jet. So this is the cell. And what you observe, okay, that's the cell, and the cell, as you cannot see, but the cell there is a thermistor inside. And here it is. And when you hit, we hit it, you remember the movie, there is a jet forming. Jet forming, and that's closer to TC, and jet forming in when you are below TC, that's a vapor phase and that's a liquid phase. And that's because uh, this thermistor, the first time you use it, sometimes they break. Because the, the thermal transfer in the, in the gas is very low sometimes, if you are far from TC. So this means that uh, they break and they make a slit. So there is a core that eats, make a slit. And so from above, this means that the hot cone and they have a fissure. And if you hit it a lot, the piston effect is such, it's like a gun. It can make, uh, it can expose the hot region 
as, as a dialect. And that's exactly what we have observed. And so now if you look at the, so we can measure the velocity of the piston in the piston effect. So that's, that's the velocity of the jet versus T minus TC in a semi log plot, that's large. The measurements in 1G, because you see it also in 1G, here they are, you see? So they are stable with temperature and they decrease. In 0G, that's the same behavior, but not the same amplitude. And that's in the, the two phase. And if you relate, if you calculate the velocity of the piston, that's the velocity of the piston, so that the power that is sent in the fissure, that the surface of the fissure, that the coupling of temperature with pressure, and that's to make the velocity in good units, 1 over Tc, it appears that 1 over Tc, this, this parameter is constant near Tc. And that's, that's the straight line. And it's after it decreases. So this velocity is nearly constant. That's why we see it. So this is really the velocity of the piston that gives rise of the piston effect that we have measured. Measured here. Okay, now something interesting also that that's the temperature with time of the temperature in the bell. And you see, that's an insert here, you see that the temperature of all the, the the thermistor went below the initial temperature. So by sending it in the system, at the end we got something colder. And that's because, you will see why, that's on 1G, not the same. That's not a lot, that's 10 mK, but that's not a lot, but it is. And that's because, you know, uh, just to explain the mechanism, the model, when you heat here, uh, if you have no convection, you form a boundary layer all around. And so you extract it by this cold boundary layer. So it's a thermostat. Now if you have convection, the hot boundary layer is convected, and here you have a thinner boundary layer. If the boundary layer is thinner, the heat flux is stronger. So this means that you remove it much faster much more heat by this thin boundary layer. Now if you stop cooling it, you stop the convection here, but you still have a thin boundary layer that extracts it. And so that's why you can go below the initial, the bulk temperature. So that's qualitative. We make this model, so you recognize temperature, time, density, specific heat, space, you know, space variable, heat conductivity, and this is the coupling, isotropic coupling between temperature and pressure and the rising pressure. And so to consider, we did not make hydrodynamics, to consider it to make a cooling uh, source which is proportional to the difference between the temperature at the wall and the bulk temperature. So, okay, I don't go further, I just make the conclusion. Yeah? So just to tell you that this model fits well because this is the, the model. Just to conclude this part, uh, boundary layer is very important when the heat exchange is uh, where the heat exchange is located. And then when you thin it, you increase the heat exchange. The convection increases the heat exchange so you can cool more than uh, expected. And uh, one V model will produce well the cooling. And since uh, your director asked me about the application, I can tell you that this could be a good application to make supercritical fridges on the ground. That's something we wanted to, to do. We didn't develop this, but maybe it would be interesting to use supercritical system to make uh, fridges by some resonance, some vibration. Now, I would just talk to another. another uh, interesting and amazing observation that if you are in a two-phase region and you hit the wall, you will have the temperature inside the wall hotter than the wall. And this contradicts the second principle of thermodynamics, apparently. So this is the cell. So we have the fluid, three tennis and we hit 
and we measure the temperature inside. We don't heat. We just write the temperature of the wall. So that's in a two-phase region. So this is a vapor. That's the three cells. And that's the liquid here. That's the vapor. And that's the liquid. OK, so that's the cell. That's the vapor phase, liquid phase. And you see, that's a temperature of We read the temperature of the wall. That's critical. That's time. That's the difference of temperature between the vapor and the wall of the liquid and the wall, pH3 and pH2. And you will see that when you rise temperature, the temperature of the liquid decreases because, of course, it, it increased by the thermodiffusion and the piston effect. And when it, it goes, so it decreases a bit more. So that's interesting because here you see that mainly diffusion that matters. And when you are close to the critical, to the critical point, it is nearly constant because of the piston effect and near, near zero. And here too. And now in the gas phase, there is something very surprising because the temperature of the gas phase is hotter than the wall. So, do you have the explanation? So now there's something uh, nearly similar, but we make a temperature crash. So we make a crash, we were at minus 10K, and we rise the temperature of the, the wall by 0.1K. And you see that's the temperature rise, that's the wall temperature with time, and that's the liquid rise, and that's the temperature rise. And so the explanation, you understand, is, is easy. Here, the compressibility of the vapor is more important than the compressibility of the liquid. So when you write the temperature here, you make a thermal boundary layer that compress liquid and gas. And since the gas is more compressible, the adiabatic rise is larger. Well, this is a transient effect. So since it is transient, it doesn't violate the the second principle of thermodynamics. So, oof, I can't see. Okay, so that's the rise, so I don't uh, discuss too much this, that's not so interesting. So and now, and now we have finished all this piston effect <laughs> lecture, and we go to the effect of vibration. So just to summarize, in this rather compressible fluids, when you change the temperature, the, the temperature of the wall, when you send a heat flux in the fluid, you have a homogeneous temperature rise, but you have a thermal boundary layer that diffuses slowly. And it diffuses uh, and much and more, uh, more and more slowly as you are close to the critical point. And when you are performing a fair vibration, you will make a oscillatory acceleration, oscillatory speed, you will have a thermal boundary layer which is different, different density than the belt, and you can have new stability control. And that's the idea of making having vibration in this system. Also that's also behind vibration can make effect of convection that is similar to buoyancy driven convection of Earth, but the idea was to make a kind of artificial gravity for fluids uh, in space. So the tests were in parabolic flight, some in rocket, and also in might decomposition. So that's a module in some rocket, that's a Maxus 7 rockets. And uh, so we that vibration is there are two systems vibrating in this one. Let's go. The cell we are using that's CO2 and SF6, the same as before. That's an under magnetic compensation of gravity. And now we are much better because the uh, map here uh, is a thesis, uh, starting a thesis. And uh, he made a very nice uh, sample, so you can ask him about <laughs> this sample. Uh, so that's, see, that's a cell. That's three, three or seven or ten millimeter diameter. That's small, and it is on an axis. So there is a rod. In fact, we are vibrating this way. Very small vibration, 
the frequency that between say uh, 1 hertz and 50 hertz or 60 hertz and the amplitude that's between 0 and 1 millimeter. So that's more amplitude vibration. Now how the, do the vibration act on density in homogeneity? Uh, that's inertial effect. If you vibrate the, the velocity of uh, the uh, inclusion or will depend on the dance, uh, density of the inclusion. And so you will have uh, difference of density that depends how that depends uh, on the density. And so this inhomogeneity will orient a parallel or percolate vibration depending on the process and depending on the non-linearity of the system. For instance, it can uh, orient a perpendicular vibration because of the Bernoulli pressure. And so everything will depend whether the frequency is high with respect to the typical inverse like uh, atomic type of the systems whether the amplitude is small or large with respect to the size of the system. So, as I told you, that the, the energy can be, can be performed by a temperature gradient in a single phase fluid, supercritical fluid, temperature gradient, and difference of density. And you see that's interesting near the critical point because a very small density difference to make a large, very small temperature difference to make a large density difference. Because the, because the, the coupling coefficient is larger and larger. And below the critical point, we have the liquid and the phases and the presence of the finite or vanishing surface tension. So the vibration can induce wind flow, but also can order the gas and liquid interfaces as on the ground where the liquid is below and the vapor above. So, the first, uh, so for the interfaces, the forward instability, that is uh, very well known. So, if you vibrate on the ground the fluid, so that's a cylindrical cell like this, and you see from above. So, that's the interface. So, below this interface, there is a liquid, and above, that's the, liquid, that's the gas. And if you are going near the critical point, you see there is a the wavelength diminishes, the dissipation increases, and there is a transition from square to the center. So that's 60 Hz, 80 mK, 20 mK. Now, if you go in 0G, that's in a magnetic field, and you see that's not so straight, that's 3 mm, this was uh, 10 mm, and you can see also foreign instability, but that's not so well marked. Now, if you put the acceleration of the vibration parallel to the interface, you have a kind of candy dots instability. And that's also very interesting that G, you vibrate this way, the cabinet at that end, you have a frozen interface, frozen in the reference frame of the cell. And so the threshold, and that's this threshold that we carefully put by, in this world by the Nimar is related to the density of liquid and the vapor phase, surface tension, gravity, and difference of density. And this is not the cavity net, you can see. And so the cavity net, you can see it, that's this value here. There. And so the wavelength here, and the pressure, is related to the cavity net. But no, now, when you go into uh, zero gravity, the cavity net uh, goes to infinity and it's difficult to see what's going on. So this is in zero gravity and what you observe, that's something like this. And that's a big uh, interrogation because you can say that when gravity decreases, the amplitude of the wave will increase and so you will reach the border and you will get this. this uh, but that's not so because the wavelength also increases. So you have at the same time the amplitude that increases, but also the wavelength that increases. And, and you have no capital length in this part. So that's another story. And I will show you a movie that's, you know, in a sounding rocket. And that's the uh, alternate gas and liquid uh, 
Something interesting, uh, Tanya, I think you, you are sure that you have looked at these small borders. <laughs> because they are small inclusion also, and these small inclusion they are order also. Yeah. So that's an interesting pattern. Here that's liquid because it works. Gas, liquid, gas, liquid, etc. etc. So that's something interesting. Uh, I can tell you that till now we have not been able to understand, to understand the exactly the process and how to determine the wavelength of the pattern. Also because in the experiments we, we need time because all these domains, they coalesce, they fusion, so we don't have the steady state. Okay, so now, and that's something interesting, that's a work of my Dimitri Lugunov and Tanya, that's a fraction between the bubble and the wall. So uh, they are uh, predicted that if you have an inclusion near a wall, uh, that's an inclusion in the wall, that's a bubble, that's in the magnetic field, that compensation. So the bubble deform and eventually stick to the wall. So the bubble is attracted by, by the wall. So that this was uh, some experiment to be done. And uh, numerical simulation. And you see that depending on the initial condition, and so this is uh, the mm -hmm. that, uh, that the amplitude of the vibration in millimeter, and you can and that the motion of the center of mass of the drops, which was in the middle of the sample at the beginning, and you can have either uh, either a motion towards this. More that very interesting. But the experiments are very difficult because when you put a bubble in the magnetic field, the problem is that you still have remaining uh, attraction due to the to the due to the magnetic field gradient. And so this couples with this force and the difficult to know whether the motion is due to this force and to the remaining effect. So now we go to another story with the surface. You are, I, I have shown you uh, interfaces of gas and liquid phases already formed. Now we will, we will go from the very beginning, that is we are in a supercritical uh, region, we change the temperature, we go below the Poisson's curve and we have the formation, nucleation, of uh, drops or bubbles. Here we form bubbles because the drop they will stick to the wall. And, the wall they don't stick. and you will see that depending on the size, the effect of vibration will be different. You can understand when the size of the, uh, the <coughs> bubble is very small because, because of the viscous, uh, smaller than the viscous boundary layer. The velocity of the inclusion will be the same as the viscosity of the medium, so no effect could be observed. And now, the, when they grow, and they grow, there will be a threshold and an effect could be observed. That's something that I will show you first with bubbles and second with interconnected bubbles, that is a semi continuous medium. Okay, so that's levitated. Hydrogen. That's 0.3 millimeter. Uh, frequency is 20 hertz. Here it is. That we observe. So we show you the movie. That's fast. Okay, apparition drop. And you see the drops align in row uh, as before. After that's becoming. Uh, okay, again. So, beginning temperature change, okay, 
So at the beginning, there is no effect of vibration when the, when the drops are very small. See? No effect. And after, they land in the wall. And you see the vibration that this way. So, depending on the viscous boundary layer, you see, when the diameter of the bubble is smaller, lower than the viscous boundary layer, this is the, the viscosity and the uh, angular frequency, you have no effect. Or something interesting also, you see that uh, here you have no nucleation of the bubble, and you know why? Because of the piston effect. Because of the piston effect, density here not the same as in the belt. And now, when the diameter of the belt is larger, they align it. So now if you see the graph flow, that's interesting, because when there are no effect of vibration, the bubble, they are in volume motion, and so they collide, and they coalesce, and they go. So that's the growth flow in, t, in time at the power of half the diameter of time, that volume motion limit. And now you see that after a given time, which corresponds to the risk, to the size of the drop having uh, this size, uh, that size, you have an, an acceleration. And that's in T to the power one half. And this can be interpreted. Now the drop they are in row. So to coalesce so the drops, they, uh, they, they, uh, they stick together, they, uh, as a family of study, uh, they uh, are attracted. But they don't coalesce at once because there is a, a layer of fluid that they fill between. And so they are very low. And uh, you see that they, they will coalesce in the wall. And so, you, so they, 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 they stay a given time without coalescence. And this can be interpreted as a diffusion, not Brownian, but a Levy flight but, uh, with uh, uh, another experiment. So this is a T1 half growth rate. Now, if you can see, uh, now if you have an equal gas and liquid volume, you won't nucleate uh, vapor drops, but you nucleate at the same time from the superhelical phase, liquid and vapor phase, and they are interconnected. And that's another process, the reverberation you will see. That's what occurs in the sounding rocket. So you see, we change the temperature, it becomes dark with the nucleation of domains. And you see that now, what we can see, you have domains that are elongated. But before being elongated, they were not elongated because they were smaller than the viscous boundary lines. And that's interesting because being elongated, they tend to be elongated by Bernoulli pressure and diffusion. They move. So they are attracted, but also look at this one, that one also. So the pattern formation as in the already did our experiment. Sounding rocket, we didn't have enough time to go to the end. So we don't know what is the final uh, stage. But it's still evolving after we have to do Okay, so if you look more carefully, you see that at the very beginning, you have very small domains interconnected, they grow, and after it becomes anisotropy. So you can define the uh, length which is uh, parallel to the vibration and perpendicular. And you see how, what is the evolution of the unit. And you see that's interesting because of LN. At the beginning, that is when the, the size LN was smaller than the viscous boundary, the viscous uh, the boundary layer, we had the same behavior. And after, this parallel vibration still grew as if there were no vibration. But the other, there is an exponential growth. So this can be explained, uh, 
I don't say in a simple way, but that's rather simple. We can use uh, this uh, equation of motion from the Navier-Stokes equation in the viscous limit. So that is the velocity of the interface is due to the pressure gradient between the interface and the uh, shear viscosity. The pressure is the capillary pressure, surface tension divided by typical size Lm. So the gradient that sigma over Lm squared, the velocity that dLm over dt divided by Lm squared, and you get the constant velocity, that is the capillary velocity, surface tension divided by uh, shear viscosity. And so Lm parallel and Lm behave this way. So, as if there were no vibration. Now to explain this, uh, this behavior, we said that's due to the Bernoulli pressure, the domains elongates and coalesce. That's what we have observed in the movie. So we get the same equation here, but for the pressure, we consider the Bernoulli pressure difference. And this gives an exponential growth. Thus, this is uh, log and mean, and you see that's really an exponential growth. So this time we understand what was that way. Now we don't understand, you know, the final stage of this uh, layer. So maybe the final stage that, I don't know, one liquid layer on one side and one vapor in the middle. That's, uh... Now, another story, but that's related, and that's what uh, Bruna performed recently. You are in a magnetic field to compensate gravity effect. And you gently hit the sample towards the critical point and you vibrate. And what you observe is the following. That's, you start from 130 millikilo critical point here, and that's TC. And you see that you have a deformation with some wavelengths, and these are Faraday, because the, the frequency of the modulation is half the exciting frequency. So that's a parametric instability. So when you are going closer and closer, the surface tension and the density difference uh, is lower. And you see this because the wavelength decreases, also the amplitude decreases. And at some point, you get <laughs> these layers. So this is a very, uh, very intriguing phenomena. We have some ideas, of course. But uh, when it seems that the surface tension doesn't uh, matter. See, here yeah, the surface tension is very low. But we still have no clear explanation of this, uh, of this change between Faraday, well, that's Faraday, in 0 g, and that. OK, now we go to the end of my talk, hopefully for you. <coughs> that's uh, the thermal effect. And, uh, that's the end, because I know that in Perm, there is a very uh, impressive school for the thermal vibrational effects. So maybe we could discuss uh, this part. So I, um, what we will uh, look at, that's the effect of boundary layer. And there are two effects in boundary layer, or that's made the same. There's two experiments that we have performed so far. So I call boundary layer one and two. <coughs> so boundary layer one, that was a preliminary experiment in the Mir station. It was the last year, uh, the last moment before it, it was uh, sent to the ground. Interferometry sample. So this was, so this, they were, people were very cute, they asked the uh, cosmonauts. Because in order to make a vibration, well, uh, I think uh, <laughs> the people here, that's not very well. Huh? Um, and they put in the, in the module with uh, rubber bands here. They attach the Alice setup with rubber bands. And they excite uh, eigenmodes of the rubber bands, either by a pot located on it, or by really the astronaut, the, the cosmonaut was shaking it and making the resonance. Uh, and we during the vibration, we send a heat pulse in the middle of the cell, 0.8 milliwatt during two minutes, 
and that this was above the critical point I will show you at 100 millimeters. So this is the cell in the atacorometer, so you see fringes. There are three times three thermistors. One is heating, they are very small, you cannot see it very well. And we are measuring in the boundary layer temperature and in the bulk of this feather. They are very small, only five millimeters. So this is concerned with theory and modeling, and what really matters is that the Gershwin and the Beam of the book, and it is very, very useful for us. And uh, also we published with a team from Polizayev, Ivanov, Ivanov, and we have this cosmic research and in physical modeling. So that's what you see on the ground. Uh, just at the beginning, uh, so this is this is a, a pressure transducer. And you see what's going on. So again, so you see the developments. The plume, the plume, and the developments of a boundary layer. Okay. Now, so again, for, again, for everybody can understand it. Huh? Now, the same in zero G, but here there's no vibration. Okay. Zero G. So there is also a boundary layer on the wire. Okay. Now uh, we go a low frequency, high amplitude. When the cosmos was uh, it. <coughs> so it's nearly the same in one direction, the other direction, etc. And you see, you see vortices forming here by the friction. And you, you will see, okay, that's the same as on the ground, but uh, the velocity of convection is lower, and that's symmetrical. And now, if we reduce the amplitude and increase the frequency, But because of the friction, develop in that direction. So it looks barely pressure in fields, but of course, but there are no surface tensions, so that's difficult to speak about that pressure. So the, <coughs> what we can tell, we have three different phenomena. <coughs> so low frequency develops uh, symmetrically across the diffusively the boundary layer along the thermistor and along the thread. Uh, low frequency, high amplitude, it's nearly uh, the same as on the ground, but symmetrically. And this is completely different because it propagates, the hot boundary layer propagates perpendicular uh, to the vibration. So we have to interpret it. But you know, and <coughs> so we perform numerical simulation. So that's the equation, the Lyskov equation. What is uh, what we have to look at carefully? That's that's the C formulation. That's the piston effect, and that's also the equation of state where we use here the uh, Van der Waals equation. And that's it. So that's the simulation. <coughs> so you see the hot boundary layer. That's the top. That's the temperature that we show. That's x and y, and that vibration is in the same. And that's low frequency, high amplitude. <coughs> so we see the development of these loops symmetrically. Well, that's exactly what has been observed. So we are very pleased. We don't understand nothing, but we have the same. <laughs> okay, now we go to the pancake, that is 
the same, but with high frequency, low vibration. And you see also the developments perpendicular. You see it's moving gently. Again. Okay. So now this can be interpreted the last uh, slide with vibrational relay. So you know everybody knows what is here, what is vibrational relay data. But I don't know, maybe I'm not sure. So this starts from the classical relay data configuration to uh, infinite plates where you hit uh, from below and cool from above. We have temperature difference, thickness E, so we have temperature gradient, uniform, and you have a vibration whose direction makes an angle alpha with the temperature gradient. So this is different from the usual relay data because you can't vary the angle. And so you can define a vibrational relay number, which is different from the because here you have all, all, also the coupling between temperature difference and density by the one gravity and the other the thermal expansion coefficient. But here that's not an acceleration, that's a velocity. Okay, that's the amplitude of the frequency, omega, that's the frequency. Here we have the same, that is, you have the friction effect, that is, uh, shear viscosity and the body shape. And this tends to infinite near the critical point. So this means that the system is very, very unstable when you are near the critical point. Now, when, <coughs> when alpha is equal to zero, the field is stable. The critical real number is infinite. When it tends to, to uh, pi over 2 to 90 degrees, it is finite, it is 25 over. And that's a very famous book. Now, uh, what we will see, so what we can, so we can interpret the data and the sense that when you hit, we, we hit here, so there is a boundary layer forming in all the direction, but if we vibrate this way, one direction is stable, that is that direction, but that this direction is the most instable, so it will propagate in the most instable direction. So this is qualitative, but this is very understandable. So it's at the starts where totally different. So now we go to the boundary layers too, and this will be the end. So you are very tired, and me too. <laughs> and uh, this is based on uh, experimental observation. So that's a, a half cell in a magnetic field, that's hydrogen, and when so the cell is cooled down, so the boundary term layer forms here, and when you vibrate it, you have fingers forming with a well-defined wavelength that is cell. This has been also observed, and you have observed it already, but uh, maybe you didn't notice it, in the experiment in a sounding rocket, where the temperature from the wall was decreasing under vibration, and where fingers appear also. So that's interesting, this correspond because you see that this finger appears perpendicular uh, to the walls for walls parallel to the direction, but not on this way. So, uh, so So what I will do, I will go back, I will go back to the other one. My computer is tired.
Look, did you see just before the crunch? So again. Look. Okay? So, so you yeah, observe it, you see that also we can see fingers with a well defined wavelength. That it's, so that's in hydrogen and that's in CO2. That's 3 millimeter that's uh, 3 millimeter diameter, that's 10 millimeter diameter. Okay, so the mechanism is the following now. And that's uh, what is proposed the following. Here, uh, there is a boundary layer forming when you change the temperature. And so you have uh, density, difference in density, and you have a difference in temperature. You have a temperature gradient here. And because of the vibration, you develop bones inside the boundary layer. And so you see fingers forming here. And so, in fact, since uh, okay, so I don't, I don't want to discuss, but you understand uh, because this, when you vibrate, you see nothing. You change the temperature, the boundary develops, and so you need a critical thickness to get the density. So this occurs after a given time. That is that. So the first assumption that in the simulation I will show you. That's we are in gravity. We are high frequency vibration versus the inverse relative times and small amplitudes. So these are the equations I showed you before, so I won't, uh, I won't discuss again. Uh, this is the box. Uh, that's uh, this is the box. One centimeter size. And we change the temperature all around, we vibrate this. And that's initial configuration. We go from 3K to 2K, 2 degrees. So we have 1 degree change in the wall. We vibrate this way, and the boundary layer will form some deeper. And let me show you what's going on. So developments of the boundary layer and fingering. Again. And so you see that uh, fingers, after a given time, did not appear on there. So now at the same time, you can look at different temperature and you see that when you are going, that's 33K, 2K and 3K, when you are going closer and closer to the point of the diminishes. In fact, uh, well, we can, if you know, there is a, the onset of instability is given by a time because it corresponds to, to the diffusion of the boundary layer. So it goes from this value and that value. You can define the growth of the instability and the wave. So the analytical solution of the performed uh, with the perm school, <laughs> far from a critical point, incompressible fluid. But that's a start. 
It seems that the compressibility is not a key factor, but rather <laughs> the thermal expansion. That's something that's still understood. So now we go to another. I hope that's not my battery. Uh, we, I think that's a projector. We go to now to large amplitude because now we have a project to make an experiment in the International Space Station for vibrate, to look at the vibration phenomena, but the higher frequency that's on the order of two hertz. So we are looking whether we add also this kind of instability with lower frequency and larger amplitude or smaller amplitude. So that zero gravity, high frequency always, two hertz at so, but thanks to the critical slowing down, it's also high versus the inverse of other times and large amplitude. And that is simulation by Gugunat Nabikota uh, here, if you want uh, later to have more information. So, that we do, that's a 10 millimeter size sample. Frequency is 2.8 hertz. We are 1k from the critical point in CO2, and we make a quench of 0.1k. Thermal quench. So, the boundary layer will not turn around. And we start with A equal to 1 millimeter. So, that's what we have already observed before. Okay? So, that's interesting because, you know, if you had sufficiently long, you can get a strike. But this looks like we have observed below the critical point in the two temperature. And maybe there is some critical Now we go to, uh, to a much, much larger uh, amplitude, 31 millimeter. And you see something very strange. Now, it develops parallel to vibration. And something that you, maybe you noticed, the frequency here is half the exciting frequency, though that's parametric instability. It's a Faraday map. So we know that we can have a Faraday instability uh, on missile. And here, the density is different than there because of the piston effect. And that's a kind of visible uh, binary liquid or principal liquid. Now, if you are performing the same, but with amplitude just in between, what you get is nothing. It's still continuous uh, from uh, when you increase the amplitude from uh, vibration, uh, I would say, uh, I can call them uh, very vibrational here to Faraday light. But that's interesting to see. And that's the remarks we can make. As I told you, relative rational for, for the phallic uh, fingering, similarities with the regular R1G, and qualitative agreement with observation, further work needed to understand all this. And I go, I go to the general conclusion, and uh, so you can thank me, you can thank me very much to stop the talk now. <laughs> uh, so, in the thermovibrational phenomena, what is important is, I think, the vibrational relay instability. Now we know we know also that Faraday-like can be important, but we we are just at the beginning of the step. But chiefly, mainly the thermal boundary. You see, all of these studies have been performed thanks to the piston effect and the formation of this thermal boundary. And the fact that these systems are very unstable, that is a small total difference, make a very large quantity difference. 
So the supercritical fluid they enhance the thermovibration of phenomena by this anomalous boundary layer behavior. So we have really a system that is very interesting to study this, ter this thermal uh, uh, vibration of phenomena. And in fact, at the end, all of this study means that the management of fluid in space can be made in a way similar to the ground thanks to the vibration that creates an artificial gravity uh, stuff. So I thank you very much for your patience, very patient. Huh? And then, <laughs> but, yeah, don't talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 Yeah. Much, much shorter. <laughs> <laughs>